Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain and Happy New Year 2021. I know a lot of you were holding your breath to get rid of 2020 to move it on into the review, review mirror. And um, look, this has been a year for a lot of you, you know, regardless of your thoughts about COVID, regardless of your thoughts about politics, this has just been a rough year. And a lot of small businesses are hurting, a lot of you might be hurting, a lot of your jobs might be hurting. Uh, your income, etc., and the stress of the past year is just one more confounding factor on top of all that that has really destroyed a lot of people's health over the past 12 months. And so really wanted to talk tonight about what you can do in 2021, simple and effective steps that you can be taking in 2021 to overcome the stress and the impact of the stress that occurred as a result of this past year. So as always, make sure you t if you're tuning in and you're new to the show, tell me hello. Let me know where you're tuning in from. Stick with me to the very end because I've got some really great tips that I'm going to be giving you on things that you can do and apply tomorrow. And, uh, and if you're, again, if you're new to the show, um, ask your questions now. It's a first come, first serve. So if you've got specific questions related to the topic of tonight's show, happy to to pump those in and try to get those answered for you tonight. But again, get those in fast because we very rarely are able to get through all the questions. So that being said, let's dive into your health related resolutions for 2021. And again, tonight's topic is really predominantly related to stress. So what are we talking about here? Stress the big year that we've had. Let's talk about the effects and the impacts of stress. Before we dive into what you can do about it, let's really talk about some of the components that, that happen as a result of chronic stress. Now, key word here being chronic stress, not acute, because acute stress is normal. Acute stress is healthy. For example, acute, um, high intensity interval training exercise is a form of acute stress, which can be very helpful and healthy to you, but we're talking about chronic stress because it's chronic stress that kills. So that being said, what is it that chronic stress does? Number one, it leads to weight gain. Now, how does it lead to weight gain? One of the components to chronic stress is it elevates a cortisol or uh, hormone, okay, that helps our body deal with stress. Our adrenal glands are activated under chronic stress. So our adrenal glands are those glands that sit on top of your kidneys, there, you have two of them, one on each side, and when you're under chronic stress, you're going to produce more cortisol. Now, cortisol, again, it's the hormone that our body produces to help us deal with chronic stress. Unfortunately, long-term chronic, meaning elevations in stress over time and long-term elevations in cortisol, so this is not, we're not worried about an acute elevation in cortisol, it's a chronic elevation, it does several things. One, it reduces muscle. It causes your muscles to actually atrophy, shrinks your muscle. Now we also know it reduces bone mass. So it can reduce your bone density. We know that chronic steroid use as an example, when you use steroids to fight asthma or inflammation or other chronic inflammatory diseases, the side effects are muscle loss and loss of bone density. Um, to name a few, but we get with this, we also, with this elevation in cortisol, it also leads to an increase in blood sugar. Okay, right here, elevates blood sugar, and that elevation in blood sugar subsequently leads to an increase in insulin, which leads to insulin resistance which leads to diabetes, right? Which leads to weight gain. So you can see this is this whole kind of scenario here, which is chronic stress, weight gain, vitamin and mineral depletion, elevates blood sugar, increases inflammation in the body. So even though we're making an, an, a hormone over time that reduces inflammation, chronically stress causes an increase and inflammation. So when, when you're not really resolving the issue. So again, chronic stress is what we're after. So, you know, fundamental question number one to ask yourself is, you know, aside from what you can't control, we couldn't control the way our government handled the pandemic. We can't control the way the media um, is, is outright and frankly lying about, uh, about the statistics revolving around uh, this particular uh, pandemic. 
But what we can control is our own personal choices and our own personal behaviors. And so this is what we want to focus our efforts and energy on because, you know, the only way we can control the government is to come together as people and vote the right people in and come together as people and petition the government with our grievances. But again, this is not a political show, so we're not going to dive too deep into that. We want to control the factors that we can control. And so that comes to what is it that's creating your stress? So the first question that you want to ask in all this is what is it that's stressing you out that you can control? And for most people, there are four primary areas that, that they're either ne neglecting, if you will, or that they're not giving enough attention to, or that they just don't know that need the attention. And those are the things that we want to really focus on tonight. So as it relates to, to um, those four areas, let's talk about area number one. Area number one is diet. Okay, most people, especially under chronic stress. Now, if you're like me, I grew up in a household where uh, food was used to basically to demonstrate love, right? Food equals love. And unfortunately, the household I grew up in, the food that was, you know, being uh, demonstrative of love was not necessarily healthy. And we celebrated with cakes and cookies and pies and things that, you know, actually destroy health as opposed to uh, create it or help to support it. And so many people have the same kind of families um, and that, you know, in our, within our families, because we express love with food and because stress causes an increase, increases your craving for sugar, that's one of the other side effects that I didn't talk about a minute ago. So increasing cortisol increases sugar craving, which contributes to bad choices with food. Okay, so people generally tend to make worse choices within their diet. Under stress, they'll gravitate toward sugar, toward baked goods, toward foods that give them a sense of peace. And that's generally the foods you grew up with that, that you know, are part of your family and part of your culture that are what we call comfort foods, right? So again, for, for me, you know, I grew up in a family where ice cream was the ultimate comfort food. And so, you know, having to, to break that vicious cycle was something I had to really try to learn to do. Um, but that cortisol increasing the sugar cravings, increasing your propensity toward bad choices. Now, sugar also creates a secondary problem for many people with a gluten sensitivity issue, and that's yeast overgrowth, candida, if you will. Now, problem with yeast overgrowth is that yeast mimics gluten. So if you have a yeast overgrowth in your small intestine because you're over consuming sugar because you're stressed out and you're making bad diet choices and that yeast overgrows, the yeast can produce a protein that mimic gluten. So if you're on a gluten-free diet and you're trying to follow the no grain, no pain protocol, this will derail that even if you're not eating grain because again, yeast mimics gluten. So if you have a yeast overgrowth, the protein that yeast produces looks just like gluten to your immune system and that can contribute to additional chronic inflammation and subsequent problems. So diet becomes very, very important, right? So recognizing what are the bad choices that you're making? That's step one. We always have to you know, start with progress by looking in the mirror and you can't begin your 2021 to try to restore health if you're gonna lie to yourself and, uh, and not answer these difficult questions. So the first question you should be asking is what is it that I'm currently doing within my diet that's contributing to poor health as opposed to what is it that I uh, could be doing or could be changing that might influence my health in a great direction. So diet, very, very critical. Now, what I've got over here are three primary triggers that we see time and again in, induce and create the most inflammation. So what are those triggers? Number one, gluten, but not just gluten, also grains. So if you're following that kind of traditional celiac, you know, wheat, barley, rye free diet, but you're still eating oats, corn, rice, and other grains, you need to look toward getting rid of those, especially uh, if you've got a diagnosis where a doctor has told you that you have celiac disease or gluten sensitivity, because these are gonna be inflammatory triggers in a very big way. Casein, but more particularly the family of dairy. Now. I've done past videos uh, in depth about dairy and why you want to avoid dairy, especially if you're new to the gluten-free diet, to avoid dairy for at least the first six months um, as a reset. Um, and, but anyway, 
Dairy is a big inflammatory food. Now, there are, there are exceptions to this rule, but most of you um, probably won't fit those exceptions. And uh, if you want to learn more about those exceptions, I encourage you to go head on over to glutenfreesociety.org and check out our video blog over there because I've done entire two-hour shows on dairy and the whys, uh, in essence, why we want to avoid a lot of our traditional modern dairies today. So don't have time to get into that tonight. The third is sugar. Sugar, as we were just mentioning, right? So part of sugar is processed sugar. I'm not talking about carbohydrates from healthy foods like fruit sugar. That's not at all what I'm discussing or talking about as, as being potentially detrimental. Although some people overdo carbohydrates, I'm talking about crystallized processed sugar, either from cane or beet or corn, you know, the stuff that's found in processed and packaged foods. This stuff is a big, big no-no. It's one of the most addictive substances known to man. And there are probably more research studies implicating the detriment of sugar on overall health. We know sugar causes chronic inflammation. We know it causes heart disease. We know it causes diabetes. We know it can contribute to weight gain and obesity and metabolic syndrome. We know it can contribute to cancer. We know sugar can contribute to bone loss. We know sugar can cause vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So this stuff is just not healthy. And again, many of you coming off the holiday season where you were probably hanging out with your family and potentially, again, um, families celebrate and oftentimes they celebrate in a potentially detrimental way. So if you're trying to do that reset for this new year, this is one you definitely want to consider taking out. Now, remember too what I said a minute ago, and that is that when you have chronic stress, that will elevate your natural production of cortisol and cortisol increases blood sugar. So even if you're not eating sugar, you might still struggle with elevations in blood sugar, okay, if you don't alleviate the chronic stress. So this, that's why stress, then they call, we look at stress, we call it one of the biggest killers for humans, for people, is because chronic stress has so many negative or detrimental hormonal-based side effects. One of them, of course, being that it elevates sugar, blood sugar specifically. So chronic stress increases blood sugar because remember your liver stores about 325 grams of glucose. So when you're under chronic stress, that cortisol taps into that liver storage and starts dumping what the liver is storing as sugar into your bloodstream. This is actually dumped into your bloodstream as glucose, right? There's this process biochemically that um, where stored glucose is broken down by your liver and dumped into your bloodstream, and your body doesn't really differentiate between stress-induced sugar dumping from your liver and the sugar that you might consume, let's say, in a bowl of ice cream or a candy bar, right? So that glucose hits your bloodstream the same way. Remember that glucose elevates blood viscosity. It makes the proteins in your blood sticky. It increases the thickness of your blood, which puts more pressure on your heart, can elevate blood sugar. There's a process called, with sugar, with glucose, called glycation. You might have heard of this before. Glycation is a, is a biochemical process whereby glucose sugar coats substances in your bloodstream. So for example, hormones and carrier proteins Basically, what happens if your blood sugar is on average too high, that sugar will attach to your hormones, your, your blood proteins, and make them sticky, and they won't work as well. So ladies, if you're struggling with what you feel like might be hormone problems, but you've had your hormone levels measured, your doctor says, oh, they look good, your levels are normal, um, but your blood sugar is on, ha on average higher than what it should be, it could be that your hormones are not working properly because they're glycated by that excess of sugar. Um, so, so keep that in mind. You can have a normal hormone test result if your blood sugar averages are too high. This is one of the reasons why these are the three food groups that we want to avoid if we're just generalizing because one of the reasons why we avoid these three is all three of these food groups elevate cortisol. Okay, they elevate cortisol because they're inflammatory. And then anytime we eat foods that are inflammatory, we get that rise, subsequent rise in blood sugar, subsequent glycation in our bloodstream. If your doctor ever ran a test on you called a hemoglobin A1C, 
what is that test measuring? It's measuring glycation. It's measuring how much glucose has attached to your hemoglobin, which is a protein in your blood and your, and your blood cells, your red blood cells, that helps you carry oxygen. So this is a way doctors can measure averages of blood sugar over time, and that's called a hemoglobin A1C. Again, it's measuring the glycation, okay, or the sugar adhesion to, uh, to your red blood cell hemoglobin. So the diet has to change first. Now, let me back up a minute. I would, I would be remiss to say, look, if you are here, if you're looking at making a big diet change for the new year and you don't know where to begin, the simplest place to start this process is no grain, no pain. Now, again, if you're new to the show, if you're new to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain, No Grain, No Pain is my best-selling book. Um, you can pick it up at Barnes & Noble. You can pick it up at Amazon and any major book retailer. But this book outlines a 30-day process for you to follow with diet change included that should help you overcome many of these diet triggers for chronic inflammation, which again will create that hormonal dysfunction and other problems. So let's move on to the second. So that number one is you got to change your diet. So that's the number one fundamental thing that you can do to reduce the controllable points of stress. Remember, we're talking about stress management and stress relief. So diet's number one. Number two is sleep. This is another big one. Most people um, who struggle with chronic illness, one of the big problems they face is they just don't go to bed on time. And so this is a choice, 100%. Now, I know many of you may go to bed on time and you lie there and you're awake and you can't go to sleep because your mind's racing, because you're stressed out, because you're worried. That's a different bear altogether. We're going to talk about some strategies for that as well. But number one factor here to understand is that you heal between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. This is when your body does most of the work at healing and repairing and regenerating. So if you want to maximize your sleep, this is think of this as kind of your minimum window of time in which you need to be asleep. Don't get in bed at midnight and try to sleep till eight because you're gonna lose 50% of this window and you don't wanna do that. Research shows that this 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. window is when your body does most of the healing and repair. So if you're trying to heal and repair from chronic levels of stress, we need to maximize this window. Now that being said, um, don't wake up at two in the morning and start your day and don't, don't climb in bed at 10. You wanna to try to prep for sleep. So, so pl plan on sleep the same way you'd plan on a vacation, the, the same way you'd plan on things in your life that you want to accomplish. Like put it in your schedule as something that's important enough for you to prioritize. So again, don't go to bed at 10 uh, and wake up at two, but at least be asleep during that 10 to 2 a.m. time frame. Now, there are a lot of things that can be done to improve or kind of to prep you for sleep. And so that's what we've got over here in this, in this um, diagram here. You can see number one, prayer and meditation. Now with prayer, um, you know, this is a big one because as I said earlier, what we're trying to do is control the factors that we can. And so what prayer kind of helps us tap into is to give up the things that we can't control to the higher power, right? So if you're a Christian, if you are, are a God-fearing Christian, this is praying to the higher power because some of those things you can't control, you've got to be able to give over. You've got to be able to give over. And, and I will tell you from experience, practice improves this very much. Now, many of you might also meditate. Meditation can also be very, very helpful. And I would couple this meditation with deep breathing exercises. And so one of the things I like to do when I'm lying in bed at night, getting ready, kind of prepping my body to go to sleep is um, I like to do deep breathing exercises. And this is where I'll take uh, deep breaths and I'll fill my diaphragm, not my chest, right? So, so when you breathe in, you wanna fill your belly, basically breathe into your belly, fill it all the way up. And it takes, should take you about five to six seconds to take that full breath and really, really fill your lung to capacity. Then you're gonna hold that breath in for two to three seconds, and then you're gonna slow release it over the course of another five seconds. This is a, a form of deep breathing that can just activate your sympathetic nervous system. Remember, or I'm sorry, your parasympathetic nervous system. So you have two, think of it as, as two forms of 
nervous system. You have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic, and they're kind of like two kids on a teeter-totter. They should be in balance with each other. Your parasympathetic nervous system is the nervous system that's designed to help you rest, heal, digest, and repair. So if this part of your nervous system is not in tune with your body, and as is the case for many with chronic stress, then your digestion will suffer, which then your nutritional status will suffer, which will then affect your biochemistry and affect the quality of your sleep. Um, your rest will suffer your repair. Your ability to repair will also suffer because we rest, we digest, and we repair best when our nervous system can tap into parasympathetics. Okay, We do our worst here when we're living in a sympathetic dominant state. The sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight nervous system. It's that same nervous system that's on when we're in chronic stress. This is again one of the reasons why chronic stress can be so detrimental. So deep breathing helps us tap into this. It actually helps activate something called the vagus nerve, which is uh, the predominant nerve that helps to drive parasympathetic nervous system function. So deep breathing, very, very helpful. A clean diet, which we discussed a minute ago, and again, if we're, if we're very simply generalizing, no grain, right, no dairy, no sugar, would be a clean diet to get started with or following no grain, no pain. In this regard, if you want you know, more direct guidance, that would be a great place to begin, no grain, no pain. Early morning sunlight. So let's move this over. We got a lot of, uh, get a little bit more room to write. So early morning sunshine, between really between the hours of about 9 and 11 a.m., depending on where you live, this is a really great time to get your sunshine. Now, you want to do this without sunglasses. I know many of you go outside and you want to put those sunglasses on right away because your, your doctors have told you that sunshine somehow destroys human health. Uh, we won't get into that the depths of how wrong that is tonight, but you should know that you can tolerate sunlight um, on your eyes without damaging your eyes, and you should get some sunshine every single day. Now, you don't have to go out at the harshest time of the day and stare at the sun. That's not what I'm talking about, but there's some benefits to early morning sunlight. And one of the greatest ones is it helps your body maximize the production of melatonin. Now, melatonin is, as many of you probably heard, is the sleep hormone. It's the, it's the hormone that's made in your brain that helps get your body ready to go to sleep. It actually shuts down the part of your brain that is activated. And you want to understand that cortisol, as I was talking about earlier, and melatonin have kind of this, this um, alternating effect, whereas cortisol gets your brain and your body ready to go to sleep, and it keeps your body asleep during the night. Cortisol wakes your brain up and keeps your brain going, right? Because cortisol is a stress hormone. And when your body is under stress, what your body is basically saying is there's danger. We need to deal with the danger. And when you're in danger, you're not trying to go to sleep. Whereas again, melatonin helps your body relax and puts you in a sleep mode. Cortisol has the opposite effect. So if you have chronically high levels of cortisol, if you're taking steroids, corticosteroids for arthritis, or for asthma, yeah, asthma inhalers, those types of things, what you're really, really doing long term is you're elevating your blood sugar, increasing your risk for bone loss, for, for muscle loss, for diabetes, and you're disrupting your sleep in the long haul because you're imbalancing this melatonin cortisol ratio. Again, sunlight helps your melatonin, helps maximize your melatonin production. And many people in today's world, look, they're inside all day, you, you know, especially during this 2020 where everybody was scared and they were quarantining themselves and they were locking themselves away inside and hiding, not realizing that one of the most potent things that you could do is get UV exposure. UV exposure is antiviral, it's antibacterial, it helps you make vitamin D, it helps you make melatonin. And remember what I talked about last time, I talked about vitamin D, the, the actual, those of you missed it, um, we just did a big story, uh, you know, a national story on Fox on the vitamin D levels being too low and having worse outcomes for people with colds and flus. So if you want the worst possible outcome of a cold or a flu, make sure you don't get adequate sunshine because vitamin D is how is, is, is the consequence of good sunshine. And of course, that's going to help build your immune system and strengthen your immune system's ability to fight colds, flus, bacterial infections and other things. So very important to get that sunshine. Now, it's important to understand that if you're using sunscreen, 
um, when you use um, when you use something with an SPF in it, that stands for sun protection factor, and this is on any sunscreen, you'll see SPF, and there's generally a number, you know, most sunscreens today are like 50 plus, um, but even cosmetics, women, a lot of your cosmetics are, are 15 plus uh, SPF factor. If it's greater than eight, right? So if it's higher than eight, you're gonna block vitamin D production by your skin. So if you're wearing a sunscreen and, uh, and that sunscreen on your face and, and, and you're wearing a sunscreen on your arms, you're blocking the two areas that potentially can make the most vitamin D for you. And that's gonna tend to lead to a vitamin D deficit state, which is gonna alter your immune system. Um, but it's also gonna affect, again, it's gonna affect your body's ability to, to, to maintain its own health. Vitamin D is not and more important than just for the immune system, but anyway, we want that early morning sunlight for more than one reason, but two very big reasons are melatonin and vitamin D, both of which are very, very beneficial for your body's ability to fight infection, but both melatonin very critical for what we're talking about here, which is sleep. Okay, so let's, uh, let's make some room here. So next on the list is journaling. Now, some people, what happens, depending on what type of personality you have. Now, if you are a self-proclaimed type A, so if you're the kind of person that you have to have things in order, you have to have things perfectly done, and your, your mind is going to dwell on it until you have everything lined up, this really is going to match you. And this is journaling. Because what happens with a lot of people who are type A personalities is their mind is going to spin when they're lying in bed. It's going to be spinning on everything they have to do the next day. And so they're going to be basically, they're going to, that spinning creates a stress that doesn't allow for restful sleep. So one of the best things that you can do before you go to bed is to write in your journal. And my advice would be very, very simple. Write in your journal the list of things that you need to get done tomorrow. And do that right before you go to bed so that your mind can let it go. Otherwise, what happens is your mind is going to dwell on those things. So write a journal. And you can journal. There are other ways to journal, too. We can journal about gratitude. So we can write a journal about all the great things that we accomplished today or the things that you set out to accomplish that day. You can write about the success of accomplishing those things. You can also write about what you need to accomplish tomorrow and just keep a running log. And if you keep that there by your bed, it'll help your mind relax when it's time to go to sleep. Okay, moving on to the next. Do not work where you sleep. Now, this is very important because of the world that we live in today. COVID-19, or whatever you want to call it, COVID has created work at home for most people, right? And most people right now are working at home, working from home. And so their, their, their place where they should be able to go home and relax and let work go has actually become the very place where they're at work, right? So when home becomes work, it, it ceases to be an effective place for relaxation and sleep. Because as long as you're working from home, again, home becomes <clears throat> work is what you think about when you're at home. And generally, home is where we go <laughs> to get away from work, right? To relax. So in, in this environment, we've created a new scenario where now work is at home. Therefore, we can't ever get away from it. And so I want you to understand that <clears throat> in this regard, maybe this is your case. Maybe you can't go to work. Maybe you don't have the ability to go to work. But your bedroom, okay, your bedroom should be your sanctuary, in other words, the work should not occur in your sanctuary. Your bedroom should be that one place that you can go, that you can relax, that you can remove yourself from the homework environment. And so you don't want to cross boundaries with that sanctuary that you want to create here. Now, if you have another bedroom in your house or another room in your house that you want to also make sanctuary, I mean, as many rooms in your house that you have that you can make a sanctuary. I mean, my advice, if you're working from home, have an office in the home that you can go into or a set aside area where that's where the work is done, that you're not working all over your house. That's again, it's supposed to be your sanctuary where you can go to relax and not have to think about the work that you're doing. So again, the, the not sleeping where you work, okay, so that your mind is dwelling on work when you're supposed to be dwelling on going to bed. Now, another part of this, the same thing is happening here is this COVID work from home is electronics. You should turn off all electronics 
a couple of hours before bed. And one of the reasons why is the type of light, the light your electronics emit will basically trick your brain into thinking it's daytime, into thinking that it's supposed to be awake, okay? And so that light tricks the brain. So we want to shut that light off at least a couple hours before bedtime. So if you're one of those that, you know, you're checking your phone right before bedtime or you're on your iPad or whatever you've got, whatever electronic device you've got, and you're doing that right before bedtime, it's a bad idea. Now, what some people do is they'll wear special glasses or they're well, they'll put a special filter uh, for the blue light on their device. But my advice to you is those are those things are fine, but what they really do is they give people the excuse to keep their brains alert. Because generally when you're checking your email, when you're checking your electronic device, when it's supposed to when you're supposed to be preparing for bedtime, you're not really doing a great job of preparing for bedtime. You're doing a really good job of activating your brain to not be in a sleep mode. So my advice is put those things away despite the light tricking the brain, even if you've got special filters or glasses, that the electronics also stimulate the brain to continue to think and not think about sleep. Another thing that we can do here is sound therapy. Now, sound therapy, um, you know, many people, you know, some of you may have like tinnitus where your ears ring when you try to go to bed at night and that makes it difficult. Now, some of you also may need something to just kind of help relax you. And this is where sound therapy can be very helpful Sound therapy would be, for example, um, certain sounds, like sounds of the ocean, sounds of the beach, sounds of, of rainwater, sounds of a waterfall, sounds of something that brings you peace and contentment. And so it could be different for different people, but sound therapy might be something that's very, very helpful for you. They make the alarm clocks now with sound therapy devices built in them. Um, so they also have, you know, if you've got, you know, if you've got um, some of these different types of, of um, music apps on your on your devices you can turn those things on and it can play a sound for you to help prep you for bed so sound therapy can be very very effective now one thing that's not on here and this just depends on the type of person you are but some people do really really well at falling asleep uh, or helping themselves fall asleep if they'll read something before bedtime as well so reading a book um, reading a book and I don't recommend reading something that's really ultra stimulating. So if you're reading a book that like really sparks your mind, that probably wouldn't be the greatest way to kind of calm down to get sleep. But reading a book that, that brings you peace and, and happiness. So whatever, if you, whatever topics that you like to read, I personally like to read science fiction because it's not too involved in my mind and it just sometimes can help me go to sleep if I'm struggling. But whatever that looks like, reading can be a very, very helpful way to stimulate uh, to stimulate relaxation and calmness before bed, which can help you with sleep. Now, talking, those are behavioral patterns. So these are all free. These are all things that you can do that really don't cost you anything. These are some things that can be very effective from a supplemental perspective. And I'm, gonna, I, I'm not being comprehensive. In essence, this is not a list of absolutely everything that can help with sleep, but it's a list of some of the things that can be super effective and cost effective. And so you'll see on the top of the list here, one of the things here is melatonin. Now, melatonin is supplementally can be taken and can work really, really great. Um, but I recommend first and foremost doing this because this is going to help you make your own melatonin. This is not. This is going to provide a source of melatonin that helps your brain relax, but this is going to help you make your own. So always start here with, with the behavior modification before you jump to the supplementation. But melatonin, it's important with melatonin, especially if you're gluten sensitive, that you're, you're looking for a supplement that doesn't have any gluten in it um, or doesn't have any potential for cross-contamination. The other thing I, I really like with melatonin is if you're gonna use it, use a controlled release. You'll notice here it says controlled release melatonin, meaning that what happens, a lot of people take big bolus dose of melatonin right before they go to bed and it's basically used up so by the time it's one or two in the morning they're waking up because that melatonin didn't last so controlled release if you're using melatonin you're going to use it take a controlled release version so that it lasts through the night to help keep your body in a sleep state now you'll notice here there's different forms of magnesium this this is clear mag this is a combination of calcium and magnesium and this is just pure magnesium itself. Now let's talk about some of the differences because magnesium can also be very helpful. Remember that magnesium, um, 
is a natural muscle relaxer, okay, and calmative. It calms down the mind, it calms down the body. Now, if you're trying to calm down the mind, then a standard like magnesium citrate or magnesium glycinate or a Krebs chelate magnesium isn't going to work as effectively to calm down the mind for many people. You've got to take something that gets past the blood-brain barrier. That's what ClearMag does. ClearMag actually is bound to a special amino acid that is known to pass through the blood-brain barrier, so it delivers that magnesium to the brain, which is what we want to be calm when we're trying to go to sleep. So ClearMag, if you're using a magnesium to help with sleep support, is the one I recommend the most because it's the most effective. Now, be cautious with it too, because if you're taking something like ClearMag, um, what you'll notice initially is you know you might actually start experiencing what I like to call ninja dreams, where you're experiencing such vivid dreams that, that the dreams themselves almost feel real. And for some people, that can be kind of scary, especially if it's a nightmare. So if you're starting on uh, this type of magnesium, you might want to start and opt for a smaller dose and kind of work your way up so that uh, you reduce that, that potential to have these, again, ninja type dreams. Calcium with magnesium sometimes is helpful for certain people. Now where this one would be more helpful, so again, this one is, passes the blood brain barrier. CalMag would be helpful if you have cramps. So if you go to bed at night and your feet and your toes or your calves are cramping up, or you're waking up after an hour of lying down and you've got to stand up and stretch your legs out, this is most likely going to be a better choice for you. Calcium and magnesium combine that cramping. Remember that cramping, it doesn't just occur in your skeletal muscles. It's also that same kind of cramping can occur in your blood vessels, can occur in the muscles of your GI tract and create all kinds of havoc. So the calcium and the magnesium combination is, is, is a better option for you if you find yourself waking up or jumping out of bed with cramps, okay? So if that's something that's keeping you awake, you want to use that. And then some people um, find that clear mag is just too strong. And so if, if you find that that's too strong, then this is your other option for a great source of magnesium, again, that can work as a calmative and as a muscle relaxer and as a kind of a, a, an agent to help keep get you relaxed. So these, there are other things here, certainly. I mean, there are other um, herbals and there are like lemon balm and chamomile and, and uh, uh, passion flower are all options here as well. As there's certainly, these are not just the only things that can help kind of calm and relax the body to get it ready for sleep, but these are probably the best and most effective. Now, additionally, essential oils can also be um, a, a great way to kind of calm down. So essential oil for sleep, one of the best ones is lavender. Lavender can be very relaxing and very calming before bedtime. So essential oils, what some people do is they'll put a little essential oil on the pillow, spray a little bit on the pillow, and that kind of helps them when they lie their head down on that pillow to kind of calm, be calm and relax. So again, these are, even though essential oils are, I mean, you can supplement with them orally, but this is probably better done with a diffuser or applying application on the, on the uh, sheets or on the, on the uh, pillow itself directly. So again, these are my sleep tips for those of you who struggle with getting that sleep quality on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, next one here we'll talk about is exercise. So again, this is, think of this as we said diet, we said sleep, that's number one and number two, the things that you can control. You can control when you go to bed and what you do to prepare for bed. You can control your diet. You can also control exercise. And in my opinion, this is probably the most underrated element of stress management. And it's because the first thing that typically goes during times of intense or prolonged stress is exercise. People tend to gravitate toward bad food choices and then that couples and snowballs over into a lack of activity or a lack of exercise because when the food makes you feel bad and it sucks your energy from you because it's not healthy, you then justify that lack of energy as I'm not going to exercise today or I'm not going to do my exercise. So exercise is very important. Now there are, certainly there are a number of different components. I would just simply say this. There's there's major areas of exercise that you want to address. So we've got strength, 
being one area where exercise is critical. Now, when I say strength, this is weight bearing. So when we talk about strength, we're talking about weight bearing. And weight bearing could be like weights, but it can also be body weight. So, so when we talk about body weight, we're talking about things like um, weight machines. So maybe if, depending on whether or not you have access to these things. And again, with the COVID lockdowns, a lot of gyms were closed. And so people had, um, people basically struggled to get, uh, to be able to get exercise at a gym. So this is where if you've got like resistance bands at home, or if you've got, uh, you don't even necessarily need weights per se, you just need body weight. So things like squats, pull-ups, push-ups, lunges, sit-ups, these don't require weights, right? They don't really even, they really barely require equipment. The only one of these activities that requires any equipment is a pull-up. And that's if you're doing, doing them. Um, so again, you, there are lots of different exercises. We call them calisthenics that are body weight based exercises that will help to uh, basically to build strength. But another aspect to activity is what many people refer to as cardiovascular. And so this would be something like jogging or treadmill or stair stepping or running, or if you're one of these Peloton fans and you like the Peloton bike, like these are all versions of cardiovascular training, uh, which is, it can be an important element as well. Cardiovascular is gonna prime, basically it's gonna prime your body for longer bouts of movement, whereas strength training is typically very short in duration, whereas cardiovascular is typically much longer in duration. And so I'd like to give you an example. One of the things I like to do for my cardiovascular is not what most people consider to be cardio, like a, like a treadmill where you're running or jogging, but you know, in my office, when I, when I have you know, seven hours of clients in a day, one of the things I'll do every other client is I have a treadmill under my desk and I'll pull that out and I'll walk as I talk. And I'll walk at a, at a, at a nice clip, not, a, not too terribly slow, but also not so fast that I'm short of breath. And that gives me several hours a day where I'm not sitting in a chair, where I'm actually able to move and walk. So cardiovascular movement, again, that prolonged movement where your body, remember the longer you sit, the longer you're, you're immobilized, the more your body will deteriorate. And, and you can't trade 10 minutes of exercise for eight hours of sitting, it's not a fair trade. So you've gotta have some way to build in movement. If you have a job that requires that you sit at a computer or that you sit for long periods of time, you've gotta have some way to add movement into that. And so this would be another element of exercise that I would encourage you to explore. And then of course the third, so again, if we're kind of mapping this out, the third is flexibility. And so this is, you know, how tight are you? Um, simple home, do at home test. Uh, you know, stand up right now as you're watching me, watching this video, listening and learning. Bend over and touch your toes, but do it without bending your knees. If you can't, then you're not flexible enough. If you can't touch your own toes, you're not flexible enough. And this is something that you're gonna to wanna to work on because if you ignore the flexibility for strength, what you actually do is you increase your risk for injuring yourself. Where I see this happen is, is people are so tight because their legs and their, and their gluteal muscles are super atrophied. And so, so then they, they start trying to do a squat or they start trying to do a lunge and the muscles are so tight and so atrophied and the joint is hyper compressed when the, jo when the muscles are atrophied. And so they actually end up increasing the risk for the development of injury because they're not flexible enough. One of the ways we stay flexible is through movement. So having regular movement throughout the course of your day, this is why so many experts recommend about 10,000 steps a day because that 10,000 steps is five miles of movement that's going to keep your lymphatic fluid and your muscles and your joints pumping fluid through them, which is gonna enhance your flexibility. Um, which again, when you enhance your flexibility, it's easier to get stronger faster because you're, you're not working with the potential to get injured. So flexibility is very important. For flexibility, you can see there are a lot of different things that people do, yoga, foam rolling, Pilates is another one that can, can help serve to be strengthening and flex, help with flexing. And then static and dynamic stretching, which is one of my favorite ways, is just to, to actually just, I, the reason why I like static and dynamic stretching probably better than all those other things, these are all kind of organized ways to go about it. But this, less organized, if you don't know much about, about different stretches, it might be beneficial at first maybe to even hire a trainer to help you understand how to stretch yourself if, if that's a lack, something that you lack the knowledge on. But stretching directly, stretching your body, 
is one really great way to get to know your body, right? It, it gives you feedback. So like if you bend over and you can't touch your toes, there's feedback right there. And if you do a runner stretch where you grab your heel and pull your heel up to your buttock to stretch your, your quad muscles, and you can't really do that, that's feedback. And so as you do different stretching activities and exercises, you're basically, you're, your body is giving you feedback where you need to be stretched or where you need to be loosened the most. And so some of those areas, this is really great for self-feedback. And to me, nothing is more important than paying attention to that feedback that your body tries to give you. So this is a great way to get that flexibility piece in. Whereas this is squats, pull-ups, push-ups, lunges, sit-ups, squats. Um, additionally, beyond Beyond even these things, if you've got dumbbells at home, so shoulder presses, arm curls, there's just an infinite variety of different activities that can be done. Um, jumping lunges instead of regular lunges. Uh, if you can't do a full squat, half squat. Like there's a lot here that will help with the strength. And then again, if we're talking about cardio, certainly these are things that you can do. One of my other favorite forms of cardio is just good old fashioned jump roping because it doesn't require uh, it doesn't require that you be in phenomenally great shape. You don't have to go be able to go run two miles. You can just do what you can do. And so like a really good starter cardio warm-up routine would be to try to just do 100 jump ropes. And maybe if that sounds really challenging and daunting, maybe start with 20, right? And there's no wrong here. There's no wrong level to start with. You start with the level that you feel comfortable and capable of, and you stay consistent with it because that's the other thing about exercise. Is exercise, uh, what wins with exercise is, is consistency in doing it, right? Consistency over time. If we're doing mathematical equation, consistency over time equals results. And lack of consistency over time also equals results, just not the ones you're looking for. So keep that in mind. We want consistency of, of performance over time, that's gonna make us more flexible, stronger, and it's gonna give us more energy, and it's gonna make us feel better, it's gonna give us better sense of self-consciousness. All those things are important components of exercise, and one of the other thing that exercise is so critical for is it's super critical for, um, for maintaining your lymphatic flow. So your lymphatic fluids you know, generate through your body. There's no pump that, 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 like your heart pumps your blood. What pumps your lymphatic system, which is a big part of your detoxification? It's activity, it's movement, it's exercise. And this is one of the reasons why exercise is really classified as one of the top ways to and maintain your health and longevity. As a matter of fact, researchers really truly believe that of all the things that you could do, to improve your longevity, this is probably one of the most important of all because what we know, there's, a, there's actually a condition in medicine called sarcopenia, and sarcopenia refers to age-related muscle loss, although um, age has very little to do with it. It has more to do with a lack of consistency of activity over time, which is what leads to um, what doctors again call sarcopenia, which is what increases your risk of dying about 20 years earlier than if you weren't doing it. Okay, let's talk next about category. Now, we hit on this a minute ago, and we're going to hit on it a little bit more, but let's talk a little bit about sunshine, which is one of the other controllable, modifiable factors. Now, you have control over this most of the time, depending on where you live. Now, if you live, you know, in the north, if you're in Canada, for example, or if you're in Alaska, this is going to be a little bit harder to come by. And if that's the case, you might consider investing in a vitamin D sun lamp where you can get this benefit even though you may not have the ability to go outside. But if you live below 27 degrees latitude, then you, even in the winter months, you still have the ability to go outside and soak up some of the sun's rays. Um, and again, we're not talking about sunbathing. We're not talking about going out and getting a suntan. That's not what I'm referring to. What I'm referring to is just pure sunshine. And if we stick to that time frame between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., that's when we're going to get a good amount of vitamin D, that's when we're gonna get a good amount of melatonin. So if we're talking about benefits of sun exposure, we mentioned earlier vitamin D, your skin converts, or I should say in your skin, you have a type of cholesterol into vitamin D. 
So when, when UV light hits your skin, it converts this cholesterol, it's called 7-dehydrocholesterol, it turns it into vitamin D, and then that vitamin D circulates to your liver and kidneys and becomes activated forms of vitamin D that helps with these things here, right? It helps strengthen your immune system. We know that, for example, vitamin D deficiency is linked to 19 different types of cancer. We know vitamin D deficiency can contribute to autoimmune disease. We know that those that have colds and flus and even COVID have worse outcomes when their vitamin D levels are low. We know that vitamin D deficiency can reduce your muscle mass, which we just got done talking about. Exercise is important for building it. We know that vitamin D deficiency can also contribute to elevations in blood sugar, which we talked about with stress earlier. So this is really a very, very critical nutrient. And I would like, I would like you all to consider that sunshine is a nutrient, not something to be uh, shunned and not something to run away from. Even if you are from Ireland and you have red hair and you're fair skinned, that doesn't mean, again, that doesn't mean you go out and bake in the sun and get burned. You, you've got to get sunshine though. And we all need to get sunshine to the limitation that our skin can tolerate it. And so everyone's skin tolerance and skin tone is a little different. So you have to view your exposure to sunshine as you want to get the maximum dose that you can get without burning your skin. Now, I know many of you have been told to avoid the sun, to stay away from the sun because it's going to cause skin cancer. And that actually isn't true. What causes skin cancer is radiation damage. Now, sunshine will, will provide radiation to you. Um, it's the radiative damage in mass quantities. If you ever heard the term um, minimal erythemal dose, is re referring to the minimal quantity of sunshine that, that it causes to cause your skin to get enough radiation damage to turn red. That's a minimal erythemal dose. And that is what you want to avoid. So if your skin can tolerate 10 minutes, but at 15 minutes you get red and burned, then don't go out for 15, go out for 10. Now also know that the more you get it consistently, the more your body can tolerate. And so that's part of what happens is as you get sunshine, your skin cells produce a pigment that help protect you. Um, and there's a benefit to making that pigment as well, because that pigment have a, has other functions that are also immune strengthening. So again, that sunshine, vitamin D, builds and strengthens your immune system and not just through vitamin D, but also what we talked about earlier, which is melatonin. It helps with melatonin and it also helps to maintain strong skeletal structure. Sunshine dust through vitamin D. Remember that vitamin D helps you absorb calcium and other minerals from the food that you eat, but also helps to fight depression through boosting serotonin, but also through boosting your melatonin. Both hormones are happy hormones as well. So a lot of benefits to getting regular sunshine. And this is one of the reasons why if your dermatologist is telling you to avoid it, um, you probably ought to get a second opinion um, because it's not about avoiding the sun. It's about not getting burned when you go in the sun. Very, very big distinction. It's kind of like, I don't know, I like the water analogy. Don't drink water because somebody drowned it in water once uh, is not a reason to say that we should avoid water. It's, it's about dose, right? It's about the quantity and the same thing with sunshine. Okay, that being said, we've got four modifiable factors that we can control that will help to reduce inflammation and help to overcome chronic stress and help put your body back in a better state of health for 2021. Let's open the floor for the questions that you guys have. Okay, let's see here. Um, Do toxins and heavy metal exposures create chronic stress and inflammation, and what would you do to detox? So, let's see, who's asking that question? Go up just a little bit on that side. So that's Stan is asking that question. Thanks for your question, Stan. The answer to your question is yes. Toxins, including heavy metals, do create chronic inflammation and can drive up your stress hormone levels. Now, should you detox from heavy metal? Yes, you should if you've got confirmation that they're there. Now, some people just you know, go and do detoxification, meaning they, they'll buy a detox kit and they'll start doing all kinds of detoxes without ever having like some type of evidence or proof that that's what needed is needed to be done. I'm not a big fan of that. I, you know, a lot of doctors, you'll hear this on from internet doctors a lot of times, and a lot of the internet doctors you'll hear it from don't actually practice, um, but they'll tell you that everybody has this problem or everybody has that problem, no matter who you are. And that's just not true, at least not in my experience of 20 years of practice. So 
Um, as it relates to any kind of detoxification protocol, you want to be, you want to have a protocol that matches what your needs are because detoxification protocols don't come without cost. And if you haven't alleviated the toxin itself, for example, let's say you have a lead toxicity issue, but you're still being exposed to lead, then doing a lead detox is a complete waste of time and waste of money and could potentially hurt you more than it might help you. So it's always important when you're talking about a detox, so step one of any detox is to remove the toxin from your environment so that you're no longer being exposed to it. And that means the environmental, we're talking about environmental toxins. So if, you're, if, you, if you've got mercury fillings in your mouth or silver amalgams in your mouth and you've identified, your doctors identified that you have a mercury problem, you don't do a detox unless you first get your amalgams removed. Otherwise, you're just going to retoxify yourself repetitively and doing a detox when you're still being exposed really, again, doesn't really help. Um, Lynn wants to know, does chronic stress affect the thyroid? In a very big way, if you, if you remember, and Lynn, what might be helpful for you is go back and review. And actually, we're gonna be talking about thyroid this month. I've got a special show planned. This is Thyroid Awareness Month, and I've got a special show planned this month on the thyroid. but. I've talked a number of times, um, if you go back into our archives, on the nutritional components of thyroid, and that might be very helpful for you to get a jump start. What do I think of the government recommended height weight charts? Uh, are BMI more accurate? So here's that's a great question, Jane. I think that a, a height weight recommendation chart, if we're, especially if we're talking like for kids at certain ages as they're growing, I think it's a good idea to have a general idea of where somebody might want to be. I think it's a bad idea, though, as a parent to base whether or not your child needs hormone therapy or is sick based on government charts because some kids are smaller than others. And we're seeing that kids today are much bigger than they were even 40 or 50 years ago because of the mass hormones in the food and the mass hormone exposures um, through environmental toxins, pollutants, plastics, and other things. So we're seeing bigger kids. I mean, I mean, you go back 100 years, just look at the size of a chair. It was a lot smaller because people were smaller. But beyond that, we're seeing high levels of obesity. You know, we've got about a 50 to 60% rate in just this country alone for obesity. So, so the, the height weight charts, maybe the height chart might play a role. But again, the height charts have been affected by hormone exposures. The weight charts have been exposed or have been affected by aggressively high carbohydrate diets. And so what we have is we have these new charts that have come out that comparatively speaking, if your child is eating healthy, not being exposed to hormones, not overweight, that you might be told by a pediatrician that your child is underweight and under height for their peers. And that might lead that doctor making a recommendation of a growth hormone or some other type of, of drug, which I, I, that's why I don't like these charts. Um, it's good, it's good to have a general idea, but if your charts are based on people that are being exposed to things that kind of skew the norm, then what are we really looking at these charts for? So I agree that, that charts might be a good idea to track, but I also agree that we should have a normal population or a re relatively healthy population that, uh, by which we could base these charts on, and today we just don't have that. We have kind of a skewed norm. Uh, what we're calling normal is overweight. What we're calling normal is over hormones. So hopefully that helps answer your question. Um, if a person is a shift worker and shifts alternate between day shift and night shifts, what adjustments can they make? Wow, I love that question, Linda. I used to be a shift worker when I was in the military. I worked midnight shift. The best adjustment that you can make is um, when, you're, when you're working shifts, so like if you're a nurse where we really see a lot of shift workers, nurse and fire departments, um, where they work like a three day on, four day off schedule. So when you're in that four day off schedule, get back to regular sunshine and regular hours. When you're working the shift and you're sleeping during daylight hours, it's not a bad idea to use dark out shades or blackout shades in your home. And it's also not a bad idea to use a happy light uh, for a, a small amount of period during the day. So for example, if you, if you are awake all night, right? And there's a type of light that you can purchase. You can find these on Amazon. You can pick them up at, at, um, at a number of online carriers. And they're basically, they're, they're not sun lamps. They don't produce vitamin D, but what they help your eyes do is they help your eyes make melatonin. So if you're working that shift and you're trying to get some of that, you know, natural sun exposure that's going to help regulate your melatonin production, one of the best things you can do is you can use a, a, a happy light it, and you want to get one. They're rated by LUX. LUX just stands for Illuminations. 
Uh, so get one that has a minimum of 10,000 LUX. So when you're looking to purchase a light, 10,000 LUX is, again, it's a, oftentimes referred to as a happy light. And use that, if you're shift working, let's say you're waking up, use that within about two hours of waking for about 10 to 20 minutes and get that 10,000 lux on those days where you're working shift work. And that should help to a certain extent keep you somewhat normal or regulated. So those things can be done. What brand is the best for vitamin D and I am low, my, do my doctor. So Monica wants to know what brand of vitamin D I recommend. Um, I'm gonna recommend, depending, if you're on a gluten-free diet, the best brand is, is from Gluten-Free Society. It's actually the Dr. Osborne line. We have several different types of vitamin D. So um, depending, uh, depending on your needs. So we have, you know, we have what are called emulsified versions of vitamin D. I have a product called Liquid D3 and I have another one called Gluten-Free D. Both of those are emulsified versions of vitamin D and uh, very, very high quality, especially for those of you who don't have a gallbladder. Remember, vitamin D is a fat, and if you don't have a gallbladder, it's harder to digest and absorb fat. And so these, these two products are pre-emulsified. So they're emulsified so that even if you're, you're lacking or you have fat malabsorption issue, as is the case for many people with gluten sensitivity, um, it won't matter. You'll still absorb them. And then that, we have another product called Ultra K with D, and it's a mixture of vitamin K2 and vitamin D in a pill form. Uh, and so any of those are gonna be great products that are guaranteed to be gluten-free and grain-free, so they're not gonna give you that cross-contamination component. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, question about sunlight, Jane asking about formation of cataracts. Does sun cause cataracts? No, sun, natural sunlight is not going to cause cataracts. Now, sun burning, again, we're going back to, to quantitative exposure, Jane. Um, it's not sunshine that causes cataracts uh, as much, in my opinion, as it is a poor health. And so let me give you an example. Um, where do we see cataracts develop? We see cataracts develop in people who have low antioxidant status, smokers, okay, diabetics, people with heart disease people taking multiple medications. Why? Because these things cause malnutrition, okay? Medicines cause drug-induced nutritional deficiencies. Diabetes causes an overutilization of nutrients and leads to nutritional deficiency. Um, and so what you have is you have a person whose antioxidant status is poor. And so then when you expose somebody with low antioxidant status to sunshine, what is sunshine? It's a natural form of radiation that our body needs and, and thrives on. But if we have poor antioxidant function, we're gonna be more susceptible to that damage. So a person in poor health that gets sunshine might be more susceptible to the development of cataracts, but not because of the sunshine, but because their health is poor, because their diet is poor, because they've got behaviors that suppress their antioxidant status overall. So don't, don't get into that again, don't get into that fear of the sun. If you're taking care of your antioxidants, if you're taking care of your health, sunshine is no great threat to you in terms of eye diseases like cataracts or even of cancers. Should you, uh, let's see, Shinquillo, should you avoid fermented foods when detoxifying mold? Also, is it helpful to take probiotics or should you avoid them? If you're detoxifying mold from the environment, um, you don't have to avoid fermented food. Again, that's if you're detoxifying mold from the environment. So like if you live in a house that had water damage and mold was growing, you don't need to worry about avoiding fermented food. Now, if you're detoxifying from mold that's growing inside of you, like if you've got chronic yeast infection, remember yeast and mold are the same thing, only the difference is generally mold is referred to what's growing outside of your body, yeast is what's referred to what's growing inside of your body. Um, but if you've got mold internally, a mold or a yeast overgrowth, yeah, you really probably should avoid fermented foods that are fermented by adding sugar. So, so example would be like yogurt, um, where we actually add sugar in the ferment or kombucha teas where they add sugar to do the ferment. Now there are types of fermentation processes where water and salt are used. For example, sauerkraut, um, which is fermented cabbage, which is made in a salt brine is perfectly acceptable if you're detoxifying from, again, from a yeast overgrowth. So it just depends on what you refer to as a yeast or as a mold detoxification. Would medication work for sound therapy? I, I'm not sure I understand that question, Marianne. Maybe rephrase it. I'm not sure what you mean by would. Oh, 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 I read it wrong. I'm sorry. Would meditation work for
for sound therapy. If, yeah, for some, some people chant when they meditate. They, they, um, they make deep, you know, guttural voices and that, you know, for them is helpful. I, I think it, every, everybody's kind of unique in that regard. And so I wouldn't rule that out as potential help. Um, let's see here. Scroll on the right for me. Okay, here we go. Let's see. I like that. Lauren says, going to meet your pal, Wade Bimley, Dr. Bimley tomorrow. He knows what a devoted fan I am. Hope he's as good as you. He is, Lauren. I, and, you know, I wish you the best of luck with Dr. Bimley in your endeavors, but you're in good hands with, with Dr. Bimley for sure. Uh, let's see here. Scroll down a little bit more. Uh, let's see. I'm a vegetarian and I have high cholesterol, insulin resistance, diabetes, and high blood pressure. Um, and anxiety on top of that. I have gluten and, and dairy sensitivity. I have an adrenal body type two. What diet? So, I mean, the first question I would ask is why are you vegetarian? Uh, because, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being vegetarian if, if it's the right diet for you, but a vegetarian diet doesn't suit everyone. And most people that I know that, are, that start out as vegetarians are really not vegetarians, they're grainitarians. They're eating different format. They're eating either soy or grain in different processed formats. And all those processed formats that they're consuming it in is very unhealthy. Um, so if you're struggling with insulin resistance and diabetes and high blood pressure, I would encourage you to think about that first. And if you're talking about just a diet in general, I'd recommend starting with no grain, no pain. You'll, you'll, do, you'll go far and you'll do well on that diet. Uh, Dahlia wants to know, tinnitus and teeth grinding due to adrenal fatigue. Not necessarily due to adrenal fatigue. Um, more specifically, teeth grinding, also known as bruxism, is oftentimes a magnesium deficiency or an electrolyte deficiency. Teeth grinding is actually a form of muscular tension or spasm. Um, so when you look at all the different things or components that we know can cause muscle spasm, again, your, your, your masseters, which are these big muscles in your, in your jaw, are what are responsible for clenching that. And so magnesium deficiency, calcium deficiency, potassium deficiency, sodium chloride, salt deficiency, all potential common triggers for that tightening uh, that's going to lead to teeth grinding. As far as tinnitus, no, not so much. In my experience, not a symptom of adrenal fatigue. More specifically, tinnitus is oftentimes caused either, either by repetitive sound damage to the ear. Uh, I've seen tinnitus be caused by parasites. I've seen tinnitus be caused by B vitamin deficiency. I've seen tinnitus be caused by drugs that damage nerves. Remember, um, the, there's a special cranial nerve that feeds your inner ear and the sound that you hear, it's called the vestibulocochlear nerve. And that nerve, when damaged, um, can, can lead to tinnitus. Gluten is a, is a cause of tinnitus, in my experience. Gluten can neurologically damage that cranial nerve that can lead to that side effect. So if you've not gone on a gluten or grain-free diet, that might be something to consider as well. Gene says, I've heard that if you use a melatonin supplement, your body will stop making it in the end. Is this a possibility? You can, if you overtake melatonin, if you're taking melatonin every night uh, in lieu of getting sunshine, if you're taking melatonin in lieu of good behavior, yeah, it can pose a problem. So melatonin should be, should be used um, not as a nightly crutch. It should be used for those times where you just need a boost or you just need help. But it, you know, again, long-term use of melatonin indefinitely is not something I recommend. Uh, Mike wants to know if ClearMag is extended release to last through the night. ClearMag doesn't have to be. You get magnesium into the blood-brain barrier and it has a specific half-life that'll take you through the, through the night. And so you don't, it doesn't need to be sustained released. Um, Robert wants to know my, my thoughts on resveratrol. Um, resveratrol is great. You get resveratrol in a lot of you know, plant-based compounds. As far as anti-aging, Robert, I don't believe in anti-aging. I believe in graceful aging. Uh, I think the term anti-aging is misleading. We don't know how to stop the aging process, nor can we stop the aging process. What we can do is we can um, age gracefully or, or properly. And is, is, does, does resveratrol somehow contribute to that happening better? I would say resveratrol is a great antioxidant, and if you have had your antioxidant status checked and it's very low, it can be an effective way at boosting it. 
Um, but as far as it being an anti-aging nutrient that's going to somehow slow down the aging process, I would say that that's probably an overbloated um, an overbloated component to just that antioxidant by itself. Um, will doing stretches before going to bed stimulate me too much or will it relax me? Dahlia wants to know. I love stretches before bedtime, um, but you may find that doing stretches you know, stimulates you. You might find that it relaxes you. Again, this is one of those areas where learn your body. It's, it's your uniqueness. And so there's not a right or a wrong unless it, it affects you in a way that's inconsistent with you getting a good night's sleep. Um, but, but I like to stretch a little bit before going to bed. It kind of relaxes my muscles and increases the, blood, the vascular flow and stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so the, a comment on delayed release pills containing BPA, not, not in my nutritional store. Um, you'll never get that in any of my products. Um, let's see. Can acid reflux cause heart palpitations? It's a little off topic, but um, simply put, it's not typically acid reflux that causes heart palpitations. It's, it's, um, it, it, it's, I'm going to give you an example of something that can cause both, Jake. Gluten sensitivity can cause acid reflux, but it can also cause heart palpitations. And sometimes those two symptoms are there at the same time, and so people equate them with each other. Uh, and they can have the same underlying cause, but acid reflux in and of itself not necessarily causing heart palpitations. Now, acid reflux can be a symptom of, again, this depends on what you, how you're viewing acid reflux, because a lot of people think that acid reflux, the symptoms of acid reflux is too much acid, and it actually could be not enough acid. And so when you're not making enough stomach acid, one of the things that happens is you don't get the magnesium and the calcium from the food that you eat. Calcium and magnesium deficiencies can lead to heart palpitations. So again, the question that you asked, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of interconnection between things, but as a general rule, acid reflux by itself is not the cause of heart palpitations in my experience. Let's see, do mercury, let's see, where'd that go? Um, yeah, do mercury fillings cause tinnitus? Yes, heavy metal exposures can cause tinnitus. Mercury is a neurotoxin as well. And again, the vestibular cochlear nerve is a, is a, is a nerve. Okay, can almond flour cause inflammation? Um, if you're allergic to it, it absolutely can, TC. Um, the other thing to consider with aggressive almond flour use, a lot of people use almond flour in large quantities. They're drinking almond milk in large quantities. They've switched to almond butter. And so like their life has just turned into a big almond fest. Now, you know, there's nothing really wrong with almonds, but if you overconsume them, if, if you're using almond as a primary staple in your diet for calories, you have to understand that almond flour and almond products are high in omega-6 fatty acids. Omega-6 fatty acids, when out of balance with omega-3 fatty acids, can increase inflammation and, and can you know, alter the level or the, the balance of six to threes, which can make your body more prone to inflammation. So it's not necessarily that the almond causes the inflammation, although if you're allergic to it, it, it certainly can. Uh, as far as being gluten-free for, for six weeks and still struggling with, with inflammation in the knees, look, six weeks isn't long enough. It takes a solid two months, eight weeks at least, just to get the gluten out of the system. You know, beyond that, can you use things like turmeric? Yeah, I, I, we have a formulation called Ultra Turmeric. Um, but one of the, probably one of the best combinations, in my experience, to support that inflammatory uh, component is when you mix vitamin C, uh, we have something called detox C, and quercetin. And for that, we have something called Ultra Q. When you combine about five grams of C with about four grams of quercetin, now these are mega doses, right? Safe to do, by the way, very safe to do. Um, you get a very, very strong effect. As a matter of fact, um, when you combine these two things, they'll, they'll support that healthy inflammatory response in the same area 
that steroids mechanism of action works, which is one of the reasons why I like combining vitamin C and quercetin is one of my favorite things to do when somebody's changing their diet and just looking for some support nutritional supplementally. Okay. Can melatonin supplement give you a very dry mouth? It's, it's plausible, Lynn, but um, it's not a really common thing that I see. Let's scroll down on the left-hand side. Uh, keep going. Oh, go back up. Okay, right there. Uh, in winter, no sun in Toronto, so how much melatonin should be taken? Uh, if there's no sun, get you a happy lamp. Um, again, Bina, the, the happy lamp will help you make melatonin. Um, as a matter of fact, if you were to live in Alaska or in some areas of, of Russia, this is a common practice. They use these happy lamps with a minimum, again, of the 10,000 lux, and they use these on a daily basis to help help their body naturally support their, their melatonin production. So um, those, are, those are things that you can do beyond taking the melatonin. Uh, Nicole says, how do, you, how do you keep weight on you? Husband and I have lost so much weight on no grain. Uh, if we add weight bearing exercise, we're going to blow away. Laugh out loud. No, not really, Nicole. I, I understand your concern though, certainly. Um, when you add weight bearing exercise, what you're really doing is you're actually gaining weight because you're building lean mass. When you build lean mass, it has a higher density than fat tissue. So you'll actually be putting weight on. You'll also be stimulating bone density, which has weight in it as well. Think about your exercise when you're doing your exercise. A lot of people w work out way too long. They don't, you know, some people go to the gym for an hour, hour and a half. You don't need that much time in the gym. If you, if you get a good solid eight to 10 minutes of, of really high intensity interval calisthenic body weight training, you'll put some weight on without burning so many calories with your exercise that you end up you know, losing more weight than what you would like to. Donna wants to know if a vitamin D lamp is useful. Yes, it can be, especially depending on where you live. Um, how much time a day for it to be beneficial? Um, depends on the strength of the bulbs that you're using. So the best way to get that question answered would be to call the manufacturer of the lamp and really get their recommendations for accurate quantity of skin exposure without getting a burn because these lamps have different ratings and different bulbs and I don't want to give you a generic answer that might not match the product that you have. Uh, Judy wants to know if I have a recommendation for vitamin D supplementation, for oral vitamin D supplementation. Yeah, I mean, generally, Judy, if your vitamin D levels, if your doctors measured them and they're under 50, um, if, they're, if they're between 30 and 50, I really recommend about 8,000 units a day, especially in the winter, just to, to get them to a 50 and to keep them over 50. If your levels are under 30, you really need about 10,000 units a day uh, on a daily basis for several months to get that vitamin D level elevated to an, to a, um, to an ideal state in your bloodstream. So, so in that regard, you know, just the, the supplement, just depending on the dose and the quantity that's in the supplement that you're taking. But again, those are, those are different kind of baseline places to start. Okay. Man, we are, we, we, I realized, just realized we went over 21 minutes tonight. And so um, just like I'm telling you guys, I got to go home and go to bed. <laughs> it's getting... It's getting past my bedtime. No, not really, but it's getting close. So we got to wrap it up. Hey, look, thanks for spending Monday evening with me. Make sure if you are new to the show, look, go over to glutenfreesociety.org. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter. That's how we're going to send you reminders um, when we do these live events, these free educational classes for you. The other thing I want you to uh, make sure that you keep your eyes and ears open for it's coming this month we're actually launching a 14 hour master class on going gluten free it's the most advanced class that's ever been created i can guarantee you that and it's going to be free so keep your eyes open for that that's going to come via email again if you're not subscribed to my email list go over to glutenfreesociety.org make sure you sign up in that column that reads the world's number one gluten free newsletter. We'll get, send you a bunch of free freebies and educational material as well when you sign up. So make sure that you're 
signed up on our list. It's the one way I can predict that I can communicate with you without being censored. As you know, we've been censored a number of times this year by the technocracy and the, and the powers that be who don't want you to receive healthy information. They want you to be sick. They want you to be dependent on medications. They want you um, to, take, uh, to take your medicine and eat bad food and, and not have the, the knowledge or the empowerment to make meaningful change in your, in your health. And that's the opposite of what I want for you. So if you want to continue to hear from me, make sure you're on my email list because that's the one way I can, I can make sure I'm getting you the information. Again, thanks for spending your Monday night with me. We'll see you next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Have a great week and Happy New Year. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is going to allow us to remind you right before we go live. But it's also going to allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long, and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.